Hello everybody, The Nameless Narcissist here once again, a simple man diagnosed with NPD, giving you the facts on narcissistic personality disorder, the things that go on in my head. If you like this video, please like, comment, and subscribe, but keep in mind, I am no clinician, I can only speak my own experiences. So, first of all, I'm wearing a gray shirt. Surprise, surprise. I don't do this very often. Um, <laughs> I'm like a cartoon character, I swear, I only have like one outfit that I um, just have a billion copies of. Anyways, so recently, I did an interview with um, on a podcast called PD Raw, and during the course of that, like it got brought up how I used to be involved in far right extremism, and how and I decided I was going to act. And I've mentioned that on my channel before, so I'm sure most of you already know this. Uh, but I thought I would just kind of go through the history of that and how it actually developed because I think that we really underestimate the impact that trauma can have on developing extremist views. Honestly, to a degree. I think that most extremism could probably be uh, summed up by um, some degree of trauma or traumatic events and stuff like that. Um, so, and I think I can, I'll probably be able to think of a few examples of other people that I noticed uh, who went through trauma and then went down that rabbit hole. Um, so, when I was young, my dad uh, was left by my mom and my mom left him for a woman. woman. And this woman was very much not pleasant. She was very controlling to the point that I would consider her abusive to my mother. Um, and she, you know, and obviously, like, I resented her because uh, my mom left my dad for her. And she was very, I don't know, like, it's, she's really hard to describe her in ways that would do it justice. I, just in summation, she was not a great person to have around as a uh, parent figure. Um, and so obviously I'm like kind of like I was and like that's around when my life kind of started going to shit uh well my home life at least um after the divorce that's when like my dad got bad my mom got bad my sister got bad it was like it felt like a catalyst right and so a lot of this in my mind uh was blamed on mom on uh, this woman because I didn't want to blame my parents for it right because I'm a kid who's trying to like who wants to like love my parents at least to a subconscious level um and as this went on, <clears throat> and so, like, my my child brain basically rationalized, like, oh, homosexuality ruined my home life, right? Um, and which is, like, you know, and having views like that made it a lot easier for me to kind of cope with what was happening, but in an unrealistic sense. Um, and then this is kind of where the issue came. Because, so, my only right even right wing at all view at that point was basically anti homosexuality and how, and like oh like you know the nuclear family unit stuff like that it was like the only real thing that i that was the only thing i really believed that wasn't very li like i was an atheist at uh, at this point i was uh i was very liberal i was like an environmentalist like uh, everything else i was very very in the camp of i am a leftist um but the thing is, in these political circles, as I got like more involved in politics, uh, people in those circles were not willing to have a dialogue about uh, homosexuality like that, right? My comments about it would be shut down, uh, or I'd be called a bigot, or I'd just be, and ev eventually I would just be excluded from these groups without an actual dialogue about what I believed and why I was incorrect and stuff like that. It was just, and like, in fairness, if there was an actual dialogue surrounding it, there's a good chance that, like, it, it wouldn't have mattered. But still, uh, there wasn't even an attempt most of the time, um, which, in fairness, I'm sure to a lot of people, and for people that did know where that was coming from, they probably would have seen that as a pointless endeavor anyway. But I think it could have probably changed some things. Um, but anyway, so the only groups that were willing to tolerate me uh, were ones that basically were very far-right extremist. What were far-right extremists. Sorry, like, fucking people love to message me when I'm recording. I swear to God. It's the only time people want to talk to me is when I am recording. Jesus Christ. Anyways. But, yeah, so all these leftist groups obviously aren't going to tolerate me. And even most right-wing groups wouldn't tolerate me, right? The only ones that would really uh, tolerate, like, the rhetoric that I was spewing about homosexuality was these extremist um, organizations and groups. And because now the only groups I'm involved in are super, are like extremists, and I'm basically living in these echo chambers where the only information I am getting is 
filtered through people who are going to say things that fit their agenda, right? Because I always say, like, intelligence does not matter, uh, does not determine what your political views are. Like, I firmly believe that I think intelligence just let you, lets you rationalize your political views. Um, like, I mean, I knew some very, very intelligent people in these groups. Um, like, these people aren't stupid, and they know how to uh, get information to make a convincing argument for uh, these ideas. I think, one of the, I think one of the biggest mistakes that we make about uh, extremism is that we don't take it seriously because to us on the outside, this information looks so ridiculous that we aren't willing to engage with it honestly, when in reality, if you listen to them, they aren't dumb people. Like, they, like there's a lot of these people there that will be able, that can convince especially impressionable people pretty easily because they're able to get this information, filter it through their narrative, and paint things along those lines, right? Like even now, so there's some of the some of those things like the facts that I know uh, from those, like it's like the facts were always true, but the conclusions that they went to using those facts were what was problematic. You know what I mean? Um, so, like, and, and I just think that was a uh, that's a big mistake that people make. And I guess like my whole point to this video is that like because I and I kind of want to cover my ass because in the future. There might be somebody who says something like that is unsavory uh, or racist or whatever, and I might not like, I might not address it because I used to be a far right extremist and that came from my trauma, and eventually I got out, of course. And like on, people ask like how I got out of it, it, like honestly, it was just that like I lost interest, uh, in, like I, I lost the passion for politics, and once I didn't have all that emotion driving it. Like, I kind of was able to recognize more of like, okay, maybe that belief that I had is kind of not great. <laughs> um, I, and like, maybe it was just like, I think a lot of it too was like, as I went through my healing, I was less inclined to have this huge passion about it because the emotion that drove it just wasn't there. Um, I, and, but yeah, like, um, but yeah, like, and so when, so I know that these beliefs do come from trauma often. And so if somebody is still is working on themselves and healing and they hold a belief like that, as long as they're not like, you know, if being like a terrorist, which in fairness, I was, I wasn't a terrorist, but like, I knew literal terrorists. Like I, like I knew people like from like Adam Waffen. Um, I was like, yeah, people were like, <laughs> it's funny because people are like, oh, when you say you're a forward extremist, you just mean that you liked Trump? It's like, no, I was literally a neo-Nazi. Like I was like, <laughs> I was literally, I like read mine, I like uh, carried around Mein Kampf with me. And I read a lot of fucking fascist shit back then. That was, uh, I like I know way more about the ideology, the ideologies behind and philosophies behind fascism than any one person ever should know. I swear to God. Um, but yeah, and so I'm not going to address it in a super harsh manner because I'm like, okay, if this person is healing, then hopefully as time wears on, um, they are going to lose those beliefs as long as they're not doing things that are actively being actively damaging, right? And you can make the argument that just trying to talk about those beliefs can be damaging in a way. Sure, but I think there's a line, there's a gradient there of the amount of damage that I find not permissible, but like, what's the word? But like, yeah, I guess permissible. Cause like I had a fr like the, a big part of how I got through that was I have a friend who is actually trans and they um, basically helped me my, like they stuck around me cause they knew where my trauma came from and was a positive influence in that regard and did challenge some of these beliefs that I had so they didn't become as ingrained as they would have been otherwise. And I think, and I think it, what's interesting too is how narcissism, like how fascism would appeal to narcissism and a lot of pathological traits that I had, right? I mean, like you can take nationalism as a pretty easy example of like, that is cultural narcissism, right? This is a, it like, it's being grandiose about your culture, about your ethnic group, um, your like people, whatever you want to call them. It's like, oh, I am part of the best group of people. And like, and I specifically say grandiose because it's not, a, it's not, it's usually not just pride. Uh, I mean, I would try to, when I was a far extremist, I try to convince people of that, but looking back on it, I think it's pretty, I mean, I, I was just lying to myself where it's like, okay, I am part of a superior group of people. Um, therefore, like, like, and I always say the difference between pride and grandiosity is superior is uh, the hierarchy in my mind. And speaking of hierarchy, that was a huge part of fascism too, the appeal of hierarchy. Um, and then there's the like, oh, embracing the family unit and stuff like that, where for somebody that comes from a broken home, that looks pretty damn good, right? Uh, especially when like you are deeply traumatized based around that. 
there's a lot of aspects about fascism that actually that I do believe like is inherent like makes people who are narcissistic particularly vulnerable to those lines of thinking because honestly in a lot of ways fascism does line up with the worldview of a narcissist um and not to say that like all narcissists are going to become fascists or whatever obviously uh like i mean i read a post here once about how there is like some narcissists in leftist circles who were like very angry when people are like oh like you have to have empathy to be a leftist and and they're like well that's fucking that's stupid i don't need to have empathy to uh have political any political views right but yeah and but yeah and i guess like another message i just want i I think it's easy for us to dehumanize people that we view as extremist just because of how dehumanizing they can be right and we basically we we forget that they do have humanity to them because they you know, say things that we associate that are kind of monstrous a lot of the times, but they still are people and a lot of times heavily traumatized people. Um, and we have to engage with this stuff more honestly and from a standpoint of, like, like I, it's just like with narcissism, right? I say uh, interact with narcissists from the standpoint of compassion, even if it has to be at a distance, um, just so everybody can heal. I think extremism can be addressed in a similar, if not almost, ide- I guess not identical, but a very similar way. And I hope that, like, I don't get yelled at for saying these things, but obviously I'm a little bit biased for obvious reasons. But whatever. That's just my take on it, my little spiel. Um, But, yeah, hope you all have a good day. Take your fucking meds, please.